If you are watching this video, then we have piqued your curiosity. True crime, man's dark imagination. And now, here is your host, Alan Gotro. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Halloween episode of True Crime, Man's Dark Imagination. You know, in trying to find an episode that we could do that was uh, particular to Halloween, I remember as a young child, my father would speak to my brother and I about the movies that he viewed when he was younger. The old Universal monster picture struck fear into my father as a child and his friends and siblings at the time when they could afford to go to the movies. The one story that intrigued me as a young boy was that of the vampires who seemed to run rampant throughout history. Questions always arose whether there existed an historical basis for this sort of superstition. In keeping with the true crime, man's dark imagination theme and genre, crimes were committed in either validating the belief in creatures of the night or dispelling the superstition. So we're proud to present to you this special episode entitled Vampires in Human History. His face was a strong, a very strong aquiline, with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiarly arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily round the temples, but profusely everywhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose, and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see under the heavy moustache, was fixed and rather cruel looking with peculiarly sharp white teeth. These protruded over the lips, whose remarkable ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. This is the first literature depiction of the King of All Vampires from Bram Stoker's runaway novel, Dracula. Most of us believed in the undead for a long time after we saw the treatment that Hollywood made to this legendary creature. But what we did not figure was that the vampire existed although it may not have been a truly supernatural being with shape-shifting properties. The word vampires come to mean those in mankind's sordid history to be one who may literally suck the life force from whomever it chooses, whether that be in the form of blood, energy, or merely health. The history of this gothic creature appeared throughout human history as quite evil and has been the perception of nightmares since the beginning of recorded time. And why not? They are immortal, after all. Vampires have made their appearance quite obvious throughout history, with mentions going back thousands of years. The first documented mention of a creature that lurked into the night occurred during the reign of the Egyptian pharaohs. Sekhmet, the Egyptian feline warrior goddess, became associated with both plagues and healing. Legend has it that the sun god, Ra, sent his only daughter, Sekhmet, to punish humankind for the rampant wickedness they had exhibited. Sekhmet developed the terrible habit of drinking human blood, and when she could not help herself to alleviate the addiction, Ra turned some beer red and forced her to drink it, bringing sleep for more than three days. From ancient Hebrew texts, and of course Jewish folklore, comes the story of Lilith. Lilith, according to the texts, was Adam's first wife before Eve, and from all indications, she had a really terrible reputation in Babylonia, where her name derived from the word Lilithu, which is Sumerian for female demon or spirit. According to one scholar, the ancient Babylonians believed that this type of demon was hungry for victims because they had once been human, and slipped through windows into people's houses looking for victims to take the place of husbands and wives they, themselves, never had. Even though some believe Lilith to be the first vampire, 
Most modern texts claim that she is just misunderstood and should be embraced for her femininity. Although there is some sort of credence in the fact that Lilith may have been considered the world's first vampire, in reality, most Hebrew scholars considered this wayward soul to be more of a demon than a creature of the night. In more conceptual texts, tales of vampires receive more substantial mention within the Hebrew faith. In the book of Midrash Shmuel, there is a reference to something known as Nokorim or Vrikoli. It took almost 1,000 years before Hebrew scholars deciphered the meaning of the word, and they came up with Nikorim, was a corruption of the word Nikros, meaning corpse, and the M at the end of the word designated the Hebrew plural suffix. Vrokali is a corruption of the word Vrikalakas, which in Greek means vampire. The Jewish people of the Middle Ages also expressed a belief in a supernatural creature known as Astria. This label most probably came from the Eastern European belief of a supernatural being known as Astrigoi in Romanian, Striga in Albanian, and Strizga in Polish. Some historical and biblical scholars alike state emphatically that some Jews believed in vampires, but not to the extent that some ancient cultures may have. Many cultures in Asia also have a type of creature as Lilith has been portrayed. From the Philippines, a creature is said to exist there known as the Mananagal, a night creature that alleges to seek out and drink the blood from pregnant women, and she also hates garlic. Although in most of the folklore from around the world there exists some mention of a creature that feasts upon the blood of the living, it is Europe that developed the legend to factual heights. Vampires are often referred to as the undead, those that need human blood to sustain their corpse-like existence. The origins of the rudimentary word we know as vampire comes from the Slavic meaning to drink. Although this word has been seen in early English texts, it may not have seen its way to Eastern Europe until much later. Some historians, with the evidence of ancient Sumerian beliefs in this supernatural being, believe that the concept of vampirism has been with humankind since the earliest of recorded times. However, there are still those academics that believe that vampires are not part of every world culture. What can be ascertained from the historical record is that all civilizations, at one time or another, exhibited a fear of the dead rising. In Eastern Europe, for example, many superstitions evolved as those dearly departed who inhabited shallow graves rose again as creatures of the night to ingest the life force of the living. One thing has always been certain. These revenants of the darkness always invaded the dreams of the living, whether in the deepest recesses of Eastern Europe or the spaces of Asia, and this is before the commercialization of such beings. Although a certain sense of mysticism and spirituality may encompass those who believe that vampires do exist, this still does not explain the reasons for the origin nor the evolution of the vampire. In the Middle East, again, there seems to be a belief in the creatures referenced as they often appeared to holy men or laymen alike as what could be considered as a jinn, which is mentioned in the Quran, whom, by all accounts, possess the traits we most normally considered characteristic of a vampire. They utilize the life force of humans to sustain their own existence. The story of the jinns, or otherwise known as the geniuses, can be interpreted through Islamic scripture as having evolved into another species known as the ghouls. The jinns already had access to heaven, and this other species allegedly acted as spies and circuitously brought heavenly decrees to sorcerers on earth. After the rise of Muhammad, the ghouls were then disavowed from any entrance into the kingdom of Allah, even to the point where the great heavenly host shot comets at the ghouls to keep them from making their way to heaven. The weapons of heaven were used against the ghouls so that they could no longer deceive humanity through corrupt transmissions what they heard in the heavens. The results of the comet attacks forced the ghouls to find refuge somewhere else other than between heaven and what Christians may have associated with as hell. Therefore, they found a comforting place in the dingy, dark, and cavernous depths of cold cemeteries. 
As a result of the scarring from the constant attacks from the comets, these ghouls often took the form of insane and deformed beings. Their only sustenance became the rotting and decayed corpses of their domain. With the spread of the Ottoman Empire and everything Islamic to parts of southern Europe, it is no wonder that the vampire legends of that caliphate took hold in the countries that the empire conquered in the 15th and 16th centuries. In the land of Rumelia, the Balkans, one ruler, Sheikh al-Islam, master of Islam, Ebu Sud, the highest religious authority of the Ottoman Empire at the time of the rule of Suleiman the Magnificent, dealt with concerns from local citizens within the district that he ruled. Ebusud listened to petrified citizens describe to him and the rest of the court of corpses rising from pits, sucking people's lives, and when their graves were investigated, red streaks were evident on their faces, and they were uncorrupted in a position other than that in which they were buried. Because the great ruler maintained that he could not find anything through Islamic sources regarding a creature that horrifying, in order to quell the fears of the local peasantry, he declared a fatwa, or death sentence, with the following conditions. If a corpse that had been recently buried seemed to have moved while in their resting place, they will be nailed to the ground. If they rose again, their head would be cut off and placed at their feet. And if the body should rise again after those protocols had taken place, the corpse would then be burned. Throughout the 15th, 16th, and even into the 19th centuries, cases of persons rising from their graves were reported en masse. The ruling party, after attaining power in 1826, even used this method to deface the graves of their political rivals. In the 16th century, an explorer named Evlia Celebi described creatures that inhabited the night that he referred to as Oberz, hungry, and the professional vampire hunters he paid to identify vampires, their tombs, and to kill them. Celebi also claimed to have witnessed one of these beings levitate in a small village in the Caucasus Mountains, where he also explained to them the process of burning such a monster. Although the legends seemed vast and ancient regarding the existence of vampires in human history, one must not forget that several individuals took the belief seriously. So seriously, in fact, that their historical legacies have forever remained stained with the blood of the ages in remembrance of some dastardly deeds. In history, though, one must consider the facts rather than the lore and legends passed down from generation to generation in order to understand the role that vampires have played in the shaping of history. Legends come from somewhere, not just the imagination, and progenitors of the vampire mystique warrant further investigation. In the 15th century, the Ottoman Empire sought to subjugate various European peoples to their will. For over a millennium, Constantinople stood alone as an outpost to protect the Eastern Roman Empire, preventing the Muslim rulers from invading Southern Europe. However, at this time, they caught a foothold in the Balkans. But in 1453, Sultan Muhammad the Conqueror overtook Constantinople and laid Europe open to a Muslim invasion. The Ottoman Turks possessed a powerful army that cut swathes through past defensive lines and one country in particular, the Hungarian Kingdom of Wallachia, now part of Romania, became the last bastion of Christendom to defend against the Ottoman invasion. The rulers of Wallachia often found that forging alliances with the invading kingdoms brought temporary peace, but at a price. Also during this time, powerful struggles between the ruling boyars, wealthy land-owning rulers within Wallachia, often assassinated rivals in order to maintain power. 
one of the main power brokers during this time, rose as a result of the rivalries. Vlad Dracul, a military governor appointed by King Sigismund, decided that he wanted more power over the Wallachian region and formulated a coup d'etat to seize the throne from then ruler Alexandru I. With the assistance of supporters, Vlad Dracul indeed seized the princeship and became known as Vlad II. Somewhere in the lineage there was a Vlad I. For six years, Vlad II tried to juggle power between the Turks and the boyars of Hungary. Vlad happened to be a member of the Order of the Dragon, a secret fraternal order sworn to protect Christianity and defend their homeland against an invasion by the Turks. Vlad II was admitted to the order in approximately 1431 due to the valor he demonstrated in combat against the Turks. When Vlad became the vassal ruler of Wallachia, he maintained his allegiance to the order by wearing their emblem, a dragon with wings extended hanging on a cross. The order maintained the steadfast defense against the incursions of the Turks, but maintaining that balance proved difficult for Vlad II. As the Prince of Wallachia and a vassal to the King of Hungary, Vlad II was still sworn to fight the Turks, but at the same time he had a duty to the people of Wallachia and had to pay tribute to the Sultan. By 1442, Vlad II tried to remain neutral between the Turks and the King of Hungary, yet still had to honor his oath when the Turks invaded the area known as Transylvania. The Turks were defeated, but Vlad II knew they would return at some time and would not relent in their attempt to subjugate the region. Hungarians under the White Knight of Hungary, John Hinyadi, resented Vlad II's attempts to remain neutral and forced the vassal prince to flee with his family deep into Wallachia. The following year, Vlad II regained his control over the region, but not without an unholy alliance. In order to defeat the Hungarian forces, Vlad II formed an agreement with the Turks in exchange for his return to the throne of Wallachia. Vlad II had to pay tribute to the Sultan in the form of young boys every year. As a show of good faith, Vlad II agreed to send his two youngest sons, Vlad III, later known as Vlad Draculia, son of the dragon, and Radu the Handsome. No one really knows what the children experienced, but knowing the proclivities of the Turks at the time, it is almost certain that they were abused in various ways. While the two boys languished in captivity away from their homeland, Vlad II struggled to keep his enemies at bay. A fragile peace had been established and then broken with the Turks in 1444 when Hunyadi attacked the Turks and attempted to rid Europe of the Muslim menace. Hunyadi then demanded that Vlad II live up to his order oath and as a vassal of the King of Hungary, join the campaign against the Turks. But Vlad II still tried to maintain a middle-of-the-road stance and sent his older son, Mircea, in the hopes that the Sultan would call off his army and spare his young sons. The crusade against the Turks failed, and three years later, blaming Vlad II for his military defeat, Hunyadi had Vlad II assassinated and Mircea buried alive. When the Sultan received news of Vlad II's death, he released Vlad III and provided support for his return to the throne of Wallachia. In 1448, at the age of 17, Vlad III briefly seized the throne, but Hunyadi forced him to abdicate the throne and flee to the kingdom of Moldavia, where Vlad III's cousin held the throne. A peculiar turn of events forced Hinyadi to later rely on Vlad III to return him to the throne of Wallachia, thereby ruling his father's former lands. He established Turgovista as the capital of his kingdom. In an attempt to establish himself as a strong ruler, Vlad III decided he would embark on a campaign of extreme cruelty toward his enemies and the enemies of his family who may have been responsible for Vlad and Marcia's death. During his imprisonment with the Sultan, Vlad learned the accepted medieval medium of torture and adopted a rather nasty type of a slow and agonizing death for which he later became known, impalement. During his dark period in captivity, he would capture small animals and relish in their agony. He would use this method to make sure that his enemies knew their fate when they confronted the Dark Prince. Impalement is a rather nasty way for enemies to die. 
A long, dull-sharpened stake would be oiled and then inserted into the buttocks of the victim. The weight of the victim caused the body to slowly descend, forcing the stake to penetrate various organs, finally protruding through the mouth. It could take hours, perhaps days, before the victim expired. The victim hung upside down during many of these executions. When Vlad III brought siege to a particular town, the impaling stakes would be placed into concentric circles and the height of the stake depended upon the social standing of the victim. The corpses decayed for a long period of time as a message to those who stood in the impaler's path. In one instance, in 1461, after returning from a journey to view the corpses of Turkish prisoners of war outside the city of Turkovista, Sultan Mohammed II became sickened at the sight that forever became known as the Forest of the Impaled. This torture was not mutually exclusive to Turkish prisoners, now known as Vlad Tepesh or Vlad the Impaler. In successive years from time to time he came to power. In 1459, on St. Bartholomew's Day, he had 30,000 merchants and boyars of the Transylvanian city of Brasov impaled. This incident was marked by a famous woodcut that has emerged through scholarly research that demonstrates Vlad eating dinner amongst the heights of the impaled. Rumors of his using the blood as a dressing for his bread also became very popular, giving rise to the vampire part of the legend. In 1460, 10,000 were impaled in the Transylvanian city of Sibiu. Although Vlad Depeche is most notably remembered for his penchant in the impalement method, he also utilized the instruments of the day as well. Nails through the head, cutting off of limbs, blinding, strangulation, burning, cutting off noses and ears, mutilation of sexual organs, scalping, skinning, exposure to the elements or wild animals, and finally, burning victims alive. And the implements were used on everyone, including children, ambassadors from other countries, peasants, lords, and merchants. Although these executions took place out of an embryonic nationalism or political necessity, contemporaries of the prince stated that he achieved a somewhat sadistic pleasure from his brutality. One example stands out when ambassadors from the east visited his court, they refused to remove their hats. Vlad Depeche had their hats nailed to their heads and then sent the ambassadors back to their country of origin. Word soon went out that if someone visited the prince's court for diplomatic missions, or any other mission for that matter, they'd better remove their head coverings. The time had come during the early part of his reign where he decided that revenge needed to be exacted for the murders of his father and older brother. At one dinner given for the boyar nobles where many that were responsible for his father and brother's death were present, during the course of the dinner, Vlad asked the nobles how many princes had reigned during their lifetimes, and they all responded that no less than seven princes held power during their lifetimes. Vlad acted quickly and immediately had the older nobles and their families impaled outside of the dining hall. The young nobles were marched to Turgovista and made laborers who worked under the harshest conditions to build up a ruined castle. In eliminating both his and his father's enemies, Vlad Depeche sought to solidify his reign by destroying all opposition to his rule. In place of the boyars executed, the prince promoted people from the peasantry and others loyal to him only. Additionally, women within his kingdom had to be chaste, and if they lost their virginity or committed adultery, their sexual organs would be removed and they would be impaled through the private parts with red-hot stakes. Vlad also insisted that people be honest and pious, or they would find themselves on the receiving end of a stake. It appeared that Vlad's region heeded the warnings of past transgressions and offenses, in addition to some semblance of revenge, and lived future righteous lives, according to his law code, of course. In time, Vlad Depeche only achieved short-lived success at keeping the Turks at bay and received very little help from the King of Hungary, Matthias Corvinus. In an incursion in 1462, Vlad Depeche fled to Transylvania and his wife, believing him dead, committed suicide by leaping from the towers of Vlad's castle into the waters of the Argus River rather than surrender to the Turks. 
The prince escaped through a secret passage and made his way through the Transylvanian mountains, seeking King Matthias' help. The king arrested Vlad and had him imprisoned. Some sources stated that the prince languished in prison for almost 12 years, but other, more reliable documentation noted that Vlad managed to get back into the good graces of King Matthias and even married one of the monarch's daughters, fathering two children. During his captivity, Vlad Depeche pursued the torturing of small animals he would catch that happened into his cell. Most historians believed he was released in 1466. Ten years later, Vlad Depeche made another bid for power and won. However, another Turkish invasion occurred, and at the Battle of Bucharest in 1476, Vlad finally fell in combat. After the battle, and this fact has never been disputed, the Turks decapitated the prince and sent his head to Constantinople, where the Sultan displayed the severed head on a pike as proof that Vlad the Impaler was finally dead. His body was later buried on the island of Snagoff beneath a monastery. Although several attempts have been made to locate the severed head, many maintain that it is unrecoverable. Many years after his death, Vlad Depeche, or Vlad Draculia, has been revered as a Romanian patriot and considered a hero to his people after the truth of his military prowess and oath to protect the Romanian people from the Turkish onslaught. He even appeared on a Romanian postage stamp. But the name Dracula would later appear in literary history from the mind of Bram Stoker. A long time ago in a far-off land, young maidens disappeared at an alarming rate merely to serve the alleged bloodlust of a noblewoman who desired more than anything to be immortal. Or at least, that's what historians believed for a long period of time. What actually transpired had more to do with the period in history rather than a fairy tale designed to promote undead mythology. In reviewing the case of Countess Elizabeth Bathory, Historians realized that she was no more than just a product of her time. Countess Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7, 1560, and her family wielded great influence amongst the courts of Hungary. The Bathories seemed to switch their allegiances to whomever may have been in power at the time. In 1571, the young countess found herself betrothed to a 15-year-old Ferenc Nadazdi. As was the custom of the time, when the betrothal became official, the young bride-to-be went to live with the groom's family and they were responsible for her education. According to available sources, while living with the Nazdazdis at this time, the young countess was taken advantage of on the banks of the Danube River by a servant or minor noble by the name of Ladislav Benda. When Ferenc discovered the indiscretion, he had the young man castrated and then, quote, torn apart by dogs, end quote. Allegedly, a daughter was born of the violent union and then sent away from the castle after her birth. Despite this intrigue, the couple were married when the groom reached 19 and the bride 15. This marriage served to maintain an alliance between the two families. After the marriage, Countess Bathory insisted on keeping her maiden name and thus signed all of her documents as, quote, Lady Bathory, end quote. She reasoned that her family was the older of the two and may wield more influence. Although we remember the Countess today as a murderer and a sadist, at the time she ruled her little corner of the Hungarian kingdom, she proved to be a Renaissance woman. Educated more than the average female within her realm, the Countess showed an overwhelming proficiency in mathematics, as well as writing, speaking, and reading Latin, German, and her native Hungarian. Her favorite subjects included biology, botany, anatomy, religion, and the occult. 
Proving capable to administer over the Bathory Nadazdi estates proved essential as her husband was often away on military campaigns and at the time the Turkish satraps held the northern portions of Hungary and continued to attack the other areas of the country. The Countess's husband, Ferenc, demonstrated his violent prowess in combat with the Turks and received the moniker in 1578 of, quote, the Black Hero, end quote. While away on his campaigns, Countess Bathory kept a close watch on the family holdings and ruled her domain with a ruthless efficiency. When Ferenc was killed in an incursion with the Turks, it seemed that the Countess became even more determined to rule her lands with an iron fist and protect the people within it. Although history has portrayed Countess Bathory as a sadistic, evil, and mostly narcissistic ruler, she did at times exhibit concern for her subjects, especially when it came to protecting everyone, including herself, from the Turks. Furthermore, she concerned herself with the well-being of the serfs of the kingdom. In some cases, Countess Bathory interceded when it came to destitute women, and especially those whose husbands were off fighting the Turks. This characterization provided an interesting contrast to the way history would remember the Countess. Although Countess Bathory tried to maintain some sort of decorum in a time of violence, the times would eventually overtake her. She grew up in a time of revolts, warfare, and murder. In one particular instance, the young Countess saw a man being executed through being sewed inside of a horse's belly. She laughed to herself as the man's head stuck out one last time. Even her own husband, Ferenc Nadazdi, frequently defiled the bodies of Turks conquered in battle by dancing with their dead corpses or playing a rudimentary form of catch with their severed heads. While away, Ferenc gave his young wife advice on how to discipline servants who had been disobedient. During one sojourn when Ferenc briefly returned home, an unruly servant girl was forced to stand day and night in the heat of the summer covered with honey. She sustained various insect bites, and when she fell down due to exhaustion, Ferenc lit oiled pieces of paper between her toes to wake her up. The Countess expressed delight at such an incident. In 1602, a Lutheran minister in the town of Savar noticed that an inordinate amount of servant girls leaving the castle for burial. When questioned earlier about the large amount of bodies, Countess Bathory stated they died as a result of cholera. Rumors also began to circulate regarding some, quote, sealed chambers, end quote, that only the Countess and her inner circle were privy to at the time. More vicious rumors spread that the Countess was torturing and killing her servant girls in these rooms in the most grotesque ways. Countess Bathory allegedly whipped, beat, burned, and gouged out the flesh of the young girls. Sometimes, according to some accounts, she even bit their flesh, drawing blood. It seemed that the Countess relished in the torture, but possessed by rage, her torments exceeded that of human endurance. After several serious complaints were lodged with the authorities, because the girls were allegedly tortured and murdered were serfs, authorities paid little or no attention to the rumors. However, Countess Bathory opened a finishing school for young noblewomen in 1610. Suddenly, officials became concerned when the likes of the upper classes seemed to disappear and then reappear as corpses from the castle. In an effort to get to the bottom of the deaths, local noble families went to the king, Matthias II, King of Hungary, to pursue an investigation. Of course, authorities believe that with such a volume of dead young women, Noble and serf alike, the Countess had to have assistance. Countess Bathory had many servants who would procure the young ladies and even participate in the tortures and then murders. One of them, known as Anna Dorolia, nicknamed Davulia, was said to have coerced the Countess into learning newer, more ghastly torture techniques. Some said that when Darvulia entered a room at the castle where young girls would be held, the Countess became, quote, crueler and crueler. End quote. The other staff included Ilona Jo, the Countess's former wet nurse, Doratna Seventes, Ketalin Bensky, and a young man named Janos Ujvari, or Fishko, meaning kid. All of them later confessed to assisting the Countess with her sadistic desires. When confronted later, 
Countess Bathory stated that she allowed the servants to do what they wished, as even she was afraid of them. Some other noble women were involved as well, obtaining the girls for the almost nightly torture sessions. With the evidence mounting, the authorities stood ready to make the motley crew, including the Countess, pay for their transgressions. With these accusations appearing to hold validity, Matthias II ordered an investigation under the auspices of Georgi Terzo, who, ironically, had been pressed for the protection of the Countess after Ferenc's death. Between March and July 1610, Terzo and his men interviewed 52 witnesses, of which 34 were servant girls who worked in the castles surrounding the Countess's abode. Quote, they told lurid tales of bruised and beaten young women, stripped and left to die of exposure, end quote. Although this, quote, testimony, end quote, was taken with all seriousness, in all reality, the witnesses merely just repeated hearsay. In the castle at Savar, one of the servants claimed to know the location of the secret chambers, and he, too, stated that he witnessed various tortures occurring at the castle. But when doctors were called to the castle to examine sick girls, they never reported the girls as having any marks on them whatsoever. Terzo went to the Chathay Castle on December 30, 1610, and arrested Countess Bathory based upon the allegations. Terzo claimed to have captured the Countess in the act of torturing and bloodletting a young servant girl, but no historical documentation exists to support Terzo's claim. What Terzo did discover at the castle was the dead body of a young girl and another one that had been tortured by the Countess and her flesh ripped from certain parts of her body by the castle warden. The servant girl later denied the claims about the torture, but Terzo gave the young girl 50 guilders, 15 pounds of wheat, and a small farm as free property. In order to implicate the Countess further, Terzo set about to torture the henchmen surrounding the Countess. Although they tried to implicate Darvulia since she was already deceased, when the pain increased, each of the henchmen pointed the finger toward the Countess. The torture victims stated that the Countess murdered between 30 and 50 young girls during the course of her reign. The figure of 650 victims comes from an illiterate servant girl and as far as historical accuracy is concerned, may be discounted. One thing that has been dispelled as a myth now that the historical record can be corrected is that the Countess Bathory never bathed in the blood of servant girls. This rumor began when a Jesuit scholar named Laszlo Turochi researched the Bathory case and when he traveled to different parts of Hungary for research, heard the rumors of the blood bathing and included it within his book. During the course of the next several hundred years, no accounts of the Countess bathing in blood could be found, nor had anyone mentioned it in their surviving testimony. When the Countess first heard of the charges against her, she tried to counter them in saying that Terzo made everything up. In August of 1610, Countess Bathory brought to a nearby court in Eisenberg the mother of one of the dead girls allegedly murdered by the Countess. The girl's mother testified that her daughter died of natural causes and not at the hands of the Countess, but the judges and Terzo refused to accept the woman's statement. Seeing that she lived on borrowed time, Countess Bathory made out her will where she left the remaining Bathory Nadazdi holdings to her three children, Anna, Kathleen, and Paul. The only thing she kept for herself was her wedding dress that she swore she would wear up until her death. The Countess hoped to cut off any attempts by her sons-in-law to see her put away and her family left penniless. Furthermore, other interested parties possessed an interest in seeing Countess Bathory convicted and then punished for her alleged misdeeds. For years, Ferenc Nadazdi lent money to the Hungarian crown who never made any effort to pay the debt back. The Countess made herself very unpopular with recurrent trips to the royal court to persuade them to repay the debt. Quote, King Matthias II knew that if he could convict Elizabeth of the crime, he would not only wipe his debt to her, but could also claim her vast estates. End quote. The sovereign believed he could solve his money problems and remove a troublesome woman at the same time. Furthermore, King Matthias hoped to lessen and even eliminate the Bathory clan power. More importantly, Gabor Bathory, Prince of Transylvania, hoped to consolidate his throne with that of Hungary, thus improving his power base and growing his empire. 
Matthias knew that the Countess had been financing the Prince for some time. If Matthias could remove the Countess, he would quell a threat to his throne. Terzo determined that Countess Bathory should not have a trial, as her crimes were indeed serious enough to warrant immediate execution. He told her this when he, along with some of her relatives, went to visit her in the prison where she was being held. When she implored Terzo for her to have a trial where she believed she could absolve herself of the crime she stood accused, Terzo rebuffed her again by stating, You, Elizabeth, are like a wild animal. You do not deserve to breathe the air on earth or see the light of the Lord. You shall disappear in this world and shall never reappear in it again. Under Hungarian law, an act of their parliament was required to bring someone of the countess's standing to trial. Terzo believed he could accomplish the ends of the court without a trial, taking into consideration the seriousness of her crimes. Terzo convinced King Matthias that a trial would not be in the best interest of the crown, as to prosecute the widow of such a revered national hero such as Ferenc Nadazdi would prove detrimental to the nobles as well as the king himself. As a result of the trials of the servants, except for Darvulia, who had died in 1609, all of them were tried and executed. Two of them had their fingers torn out before the executioner burnt their bodies. Fitzgo lost his head. Another woman, an alleged witch, was implicated in the crimes as well and suffered a burning. Most of the noble women who either procured the girls or participated in their ritual slaughter were never brought to justice. As for the Countess, King Matthias ordered Countess Bathory to be contained within the walls of Chathay Castle and but for the exception of an occasional visit from her daughter and Terzo's wife to steal her jewels. Countess Bathory languished alone with the exception of a guard to watch her. Elizabeth Bathory died on August 14, 1614. Many tales have been told regarding the quote, bloody Countess, end quote and history has been unfair in some instances. But one thing has been for certain. Countess Bathory may have deserved her moniker for the cruelty and sadistic behavior she exhibited, but that behavior can only be attributed to the age in which she lived rather than a myth of her bloodletting. In 1656, in the small Croatian village of Kringa, Jur Grando, a local resident, died suddenly and was buried in the local cemetery by the village priest, Father Giorgio. Shortly after his internment, villagers stated they began to see Jur walking around the village at night, knocking on the doors of houses. In this part of southeastern Europe, the villagers believed in a type of vampire known as the Strigon. The Strigon was believed to have been sorcerers who feasted on the blood of children during their lifetimes and after their demise, they frequented the villages where they once lived, roaming the streets at night. The local legend stated that if a Strigon knocked upon the door of a local villager, within a few days, that villager would die. It was also said that the Strigon also had a taste for young and beautiful widows. Because of the fear that villagers exhibited regarding this type of vampire, they felt they should hunt the creature down and kill it before any further deaths may occur as a result of the vampire's nocturnal visits. In 1672, after witnessing what seemed to be various unexplained deaths, the mayor of Kringa, Miho Rodetic, organized a hunting party and set out to find the vampire whom they knew to be Jure Grando. A total of nine men ventured to the local cemetery and opened Grando's grave. What they saw was a perfectly preserved body that exhibited signs of vampirism. For example, blood on the lips and the abdomen that appeared to have been gorged with blood. 
they fled in fear. Once the mayor became involved again, he regrouped the men and revisited Grando's grave. When the local priest, who was also present, invoked the name of Jesus Christ to exorcise the vampire, this did not seem to work. The men then tried to stab the vampire through the abdomen with a stake, and this seemed to have no effect as well. Subsequently, one of the nine men decapitated Grando's corpse, and the others recovered the grave with the dirt. This seemed to work. Over the years, the story of Jur Grando seemed to be forgotten, but lately the small Croatian village of Kringa has sought to resurrect the legend of Jur Grando in the hopes that they would be able to cash in on the tourist dollars. During the early to mid-17th century, it seemed as though a vampire epidemic had plagued Eastern and Central Europe. Most of the stories of vampires running rampant throughout the continent emanated from the small villages and hamlets where inhabitants reported corpses with fresh blood on their lips or savage attacks within the dead of night in communities where the beings perpetrating attacks were once thought to have recently died. Historians have traced the beginnings of the vampire hysteria to a small village, Kisilova, Hungary, in 1725. One cold evening, a Mrs. Blagojevich heard a knock at her door, and when she answered it, her husband stood there and demanded that she give him his shoes. This occurred ten weeks after she buried her husband. When villagers reported the incident to the local military governor, he reacted with a great deal of skepticism. But then, eight more people died after short illnesses. Allegedly, the dead Blagojevich crept into the houses of his former neighbors, laid on top of them, forcing the air from their lungs and thereby crushing them. This story, told with others with the same conviction, appeared in professional journals with over 20 treatises that covered the vampirism topic where the learning centers of Europe kept these works within their catalogs. Even London newspapers in the 18th century reported that dead bodies suck the blood of the living, for the latter visibly dried up, while the former are filled with blood. The Austrian government took the threat of vampires so seriously that they organized a vampire hunting unit, replete with crosses, holy water, and silver bullets. Even though it appeared that authorities organized a special squad to hunt these nocturnal creatures, Vampire stories continued to appear throughout Eastern Europe during the 18th century. In 1732, one of the most interesting cases that presented evidence of vampirism was recounted from the records kept by historians at the time and reported to authorities who visited the small village of Medvegia, located in southern Serbia. The tale told of a man named Arnold Paol. Paol died tragically when he broke his neck in a fall from a hay wagon. Pale had been troubled throughout his lifetime by what he claimed was a vampire. The story tells that Pale went to the vampire's grave, ate some dirt, and even drank some of the vampire's blood in a peasant way of alleviating the curse of the vampire that seemed to plague him throughout his life. After Pale's death, though, villagers claimed that the deceased and troubled man had appeared to over 20 people in and around the small Serbian village. In fact, Local authorities swore that Paol murdered four of their citizens. Following the advice of a soldier, the villagers disinterred Paol and noticed that his body showed no signs of decay at all and fresh blood had flowed from his eyes, nose, mouth and ears, that the shirt, the covering and the coffin were completely bloody, that the old nails on his hands and feet along with his skin had fallen off and that new ones had grown, and since they saw from this that he was a true vampire, they drove a stake through his heart, according to their custom, whereby he gave an audible groan and bled copiously. 
Thereupon they burned the body to the same day to ashes and threw these into the grave. These people say further that all those who were tormented and killed by the vampire must themselves become vampires. The villagers then turned to the four people Paol murdered and destroyed their corpses in the same way that they destroyed Paol's. Although the bodies of five vampires had been destroyed, this area of Eastern Europe seemed to have fought off the undead long after the death and destruction of Andrew Paol. It became so epidemic that the villagers in this small area exhumed most of the graves of the most recently buried to determine whether they had joined the ranks of the undead. Throughout New England in the United States, one will find several out-of-the-way places that contain the most stunningly gothic atmospheres. In the state of Rhode Island, there lies a cemetery that contains just 25 burials, but one of the graves tells of a story that people truly believed a vampire existed within their midst. The tale began in 1776 when a farmer named Stukely, who had 14 children, dreamed that half of the trees in his orchard had died. The farmer never realized that the dream contained any meaning until his eldest daughter, Sarah, soon contracted consumption and died. Soon after Sarah's death, her younger sister soon became very ill. But the younger sister had a strange story to tell, stating that her departed sister came to visit her during the night. When Sarah visited her sister, she sat on some part of her sister's body, causing great discomfort. Subsequent to these nocturnal visits, the sister also died. After the death of his second child, Stukely's children began to pass in sequence. It was then that the rest of the family began to experience the visits from his first child. Because of the spread of these stories regarding the visitations, the tale spread throughout the Stukely's village and the citizens soon became very concerned. Neighbors of the bereaved family crowded into the local cemetery and exhumed the graves of the recently buried Stukeleys. All of the remains appeared to be experiencing the normal stages of decay, but when Sarah's grave had been opened, they noticed that her eyes were open, her hair and nails appeared to have grown, and fresh blood was found within her heart. In order to end the perceived threat that Sarah had become a vampire, her heart was removed and burned on a rock. At least, this is the story that had been told, but several facts had been discovered since then that practically dispel the Stukely vampire story. Sarah actually died in 1799 and was not the eldest of the Stukely children. Additionally, only four children died that year, not six, according to the accepted story. Although the cemetery where Sarah and the rest of the Stukely family is buried, one may surmise that the vampire facet of the story might be slightly embellished. It demonstrated how even the fear of a supernatural being could be generated without any actual evidence that the accused vampire drank the blood of the living, much less wiped out a whole family in keeping itself nourished. In the late 19th century in New England, specifically in the location known as Exeter, Rhode Island, a small, what would be considered, border town. In 1892, after the Civil War, the casualties from that conflict decimated the population of young men and Exeter became a location closely resembling a ghost town. Also in that year, tuberculosis, the White Plague, 
also decimated the civilian population. The scourge of consumption took many lives in the area and many families mourned the loss of loved ones to the deadly disease. The disease infected New England to a great extent starting in the 1730s, making resurgences throughout the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. From an 18th century description, the emaciated figure strikes one with terror, the forehead covered with drops of sweat, the cheeks panted with a livid crimson, the eyes sunk, the breathing offensive, quick and laborious, and the cough so incessant as to scarce allow the wretched sufferer time to tell his complaints. Even though the bacterium had been identified in 1883 that caused the disease, no cure existed, and most of the time those that suffered from the malady wasted away for months and perhaps years. With no cure, the only hope was to stall progression which in many areas of the world differed greatly. The Brown family saw their relations ravaged by the disease starting in 1882 when the matriarch of the family, Mary Eliza, passed. Then Mary Eliza's daughter, Mary Olive, died at the age of 20 years of age in the following year. Within a few years, Edwin Brown, a son, died from what appeared to have been tuberculosis. When the disease infected Edwin Brown, Mary Olive's son, he was described as a big husky man, and he left the area heading toward Colorado Springs where the climate and elevation may have helped his condition. In December of 1892, the other daughter, Mercy Lena Brown, fell ill with the deadly disease. She fell ill nearly a decade after other family members and when the doctor was summoned for some semblance of comfort and treatment, her father stated to his neighbors that nothing more could be done. In early January, Mercy Lena Brown succumbed to the disease. Meanwhile, Edwin, her brother, after a brief remission, had returned from Colorado, but his condition got steadily worse. Subsequent to Mercy's death, her father, George, was approached by some members of the community regarding the recent tragic series of events involving his family and offered an alternative explanation as to why his family passed away. Some of the villagers suggested a diabolical alternative to the strange deaths of the Brown family. They suggested that the dead women were not dead after all and preying on the living members of the family, more specifically Edwin, whom the women were secretly feasting on the living tissue and the blood of Edwin. The suggestion strongly advocated that if this monster or monsters were discovered and then destroyed, Edwin would be saved. The villagers then politely requested that George Brown grant his permission to exhume the bodies of his wife and daughters in order to check for fresh blood in their hearts. When the villagers exhumed the bodies, they noticed that Mary Olive and Mary Oliver had been dead for quite some time and their remains were barely decomposed. Then they dug up Mercy Lena's body. It appeared that the body was in a fairly well-preserved state. The heart and liver were removed and in cutting open the heart, clotted and decomposed blood was found. Even though it appeared that the doctor present at the time determined that the woman died from tuberculosis and the exhumation took place in the middle of winter, the villagers worked undeterred and proceeded to burn Mercy Lena's heart and liver on a rock, feeding the ashes to Edwin in compliance with some sort of yet-to-be-determined ritual that would save his life. Edwin died two months later. The narrative about the family of Mercy Lena Brown and the vampire panic in New England still permeates through the internet and other writings to this day. In addition to the folklore discussed within this presentation, from China we have the Shangxi, in India the Rakshasa, from Iceland the Dragur, from Ireland and Scotland the Boaban Sith, in Spain the Guazana or Guajona, among the Ashanti people in Africa the Asan Bosun, and from the South African Cape region the Impadulu. 
Most every culture possesses the belief of a creature that could sustain itself through the blood and deaths of those around it. All of the historical documentation discussed within this presentation may just be a misunderstanding or misinterpretation of the symptoms of a medical condition. Porphyria has been diagnosed as an illness where the person suffering from the affliction has an affinity to bright lights and their skin takes on a rather pale pallor. It stands as an example of things that we do not understand we tend to shun, hate, or create superstitions that can get out of hand. Although the novel written by Bram Stoker held sway over the realm of Gothic literature for well over a hundred years, in 1871, 36 years before the release of Dracula, a truly Gothic and horrific vampire story originated in Ireland named Carmilla, a novella produced by Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu. The novel is told from the first person through the eyes of a young girl named Laura and how this mysterious woman entered her family's life. The story has a homoerotic type of flavor, but stands as the true vampire story written before Dracula. Although there are many who believe that Dr. Stefan Polidori's story, Vampire, was the first truly vampire story in literature, Carmilla became infused with the folklore normally associated with the undead into a really believable story. On True Crime Man's Dark Imagination, we have dealt with the facts surrounding historical murders. During the course that this channel has been online, we have covered individuals known as vampires, such as Peter Curtin, Fritz Harmon, and we have presented stories uh, recently of modern day vampires, such as Richard Trenton Chase, the vampire of Sacramento. And we will, in the future, present profiles of Rod Farrell, a teenage goth who believed himself to be a 500-year-old vampire named Visago, who led a vampire cult responsible for the brutal murders of two parents in Florida. One thing has become readily apparent during the formulation of this episode. Some people who believe themselves to be vampires certainly agree that the lifestyle may fit the way they exist. But when we actually look at the behavior and the belief of immortality, all we see are those who exhibit a free way of thinking, no matter how misunderstood they may be. Just because one assumes the identity of immortality does not necessarily make it so. It creates a dangerous aura within the individual where they may endanger others to achieve selfish ends. So do vampires really exist? I always inform my students that legends have to originate from somewhere. Until next time. Hello everyone, this is Alan Goto, your host of True Crime Man's Dark Imagination. If you would like to support our channel, you can become a member of Subscribestar. There are different levels and subscribers get special privileges. Also, we do have a PayPal account. If you enjoy our work here, please think about subscribing. I will leave the links below in the comment section. We thank you very much for your viewing and please stay tuned for future programs.